Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Sand. I'm the chief analyst at Sineda, the world's leading benchmarking and market analytics platform for ocean shipping freight rates and air freight rates too. I'm super happy to be in front of you today at the International Trade Live event, sharing our ocean shipping outlook for 2024. Risks and opportunities, there's always a flip side to the coin when you work in global logistics and optimize your supply chains in whichever form they may take, whether that's air, whether that's ocean, whether that's truck, rail, anything, never a dull day in shipping. So be very much aware that everything that I say during this session, believe so at your own risk, but we do analyze the markets every single day to the best of our abilities. And we're super happy to share our thoughts also with you today at this event. In brief, I would say there's tons of data to be analyzed when you're looking at the market out there. That goes for ocean shipping, goes for air freight, and it goes for, well, macroeconomics that in the end of it all, basically drives the market. I mean, without an eager buyer at one end of the world and an eager seller at the other end of the world, global supply chains and logistics would be a non-existing industry. I think today, and I think that goes for all of us, we realize that we are almost the world's largest invisible industry with some of the most recent major incidents like COVID, like ever given getting stuck in Suez Canal, stuff like that uh, have basically, say, ballooned ocean shipping from being something very few people knew about to something that you can talk to anyone about, even at a Friday night bar. No more Friday night bar. Let's get down to business. At the top of it all, ocean shipping markets is all about demand and supply. Giving you a little bit of a brief in terms of where do we come from. This is courtesy of our partner CTS. So we do follow uh, the market and measure uh, demand for container shipping in the volumes that is carried on a global scale. So this is all trades on a global scale measured in standard T use, realizing that some 80% of everything that is transported is actually twice the size. If you use, uh, this seems to be the standard measurement for demand. Nevertheless, as you can see in the orange line here, the most recent data that we have available right now, August for uh, 2023, we see some 13.3 million CEUs being uh, transported during the month of August. That is second month in a row where we see uh, demand uh, going further up. And we actually also see now that uh, that we are into the best month for 2023 so far, heading into what uh, basically where we are right now in, in early November. It's like the peak season in whichever form it didn't take is all in the history books already. Uh, so uh, so when you extend what's shown here, uh, basically look at the uh, seasonality, a uh, thing that I will also refer to when, uh, when talking more in depth about those six factors that we have set out for you to watch in 2024 in order to understand and at least get to grip with the main factors that will decide the essential freight rates in the spot market, but also long-term market for 2024. But at least this is a little bit of hindsight. You uh, obviously uh, get, say, the chills from looking at 2022, sorry, 2020, uh, the COVID year uh, taking its, uh, its, its initial dip, uh, and then really a massive years, 2021 and, and at least 2022 until, well, it all fell off the cliff with the uh, demand uh, evaporating in the final four months. So in recap, 2023, we call that at Seneta a transition year between the crazy COVID years and the years that is about to be mostly defined by a huge inflow of capacity ordered by the carriers during the COVID years, now getting delivered into active service at a point in time where it's not 
really need it. That brings me basically to the conclusion. Not because this is a super short presentation, but just so you're all aware of where do we see the market in major terms. To the left, a couple of, couple of numbers. We expect demand to be in positive territory in 2024, again, following two years of falling demand to the extent of 2.5 percent well basically we put out a range of two three percent uh, more or less matching where global gdp will also be next year with a little less global trade growth than what you see in global gdp the supply side in the world of ocean shipping that's the amount of uh, shipping capacity in the form of fully cellular container ships that will be uh, fed into active service from the far eastern shipyards that are building them we expect supply to grow by some six to seven percent for the next year obviously when you stack those two together you can see that the market fundamentals are really not favoring higher rates uh, for the carriers but uh, basically uh, spoiled for choice uh, from shippers that uh, that should embrace and take this opportunity also to reinforce uh, their relationships with their uh, carriers or freight forwarders at rates that are much different from where they were during the COVID years. Down by, well, 80, 90%, depending on which trade you are, uh, at least for the spot market, uh, where we can see also the long-term uh, market is uh, trending is also downwards. But you should also realize that when you follow uh, Cinevas uh, XSI, which is a monthly gauge of uh, all valid contracts in the long uh, market, uh, you will definitely still realize that shippers are paying much more in the current market on those contracts when compared to pre-pandemic years. But when you look into 2024, which we do obviously right here, right now, you should expect also some downward trend to uh, to come about in the XSI, as well as where we can see in the long-term contracts that are done right here, right now. Some are already below uh, spot market, which is kind of like an, a, a normal feature of, uh, of any market. But we also do have, uh, say, markets where the spot is still below long-term. So still some transition between where we are now and where we will be going forward. So those are, in essence, some of the main takes for uh, the 2024 year ahead of us. One thing that I will also get back to you is the fact that we see no two traits are alike. And what do we mean by that? Well, we basically mean that if you focus only on a few main halls or only a few halls, be it back hall or front hall, depending on where you ship your goods or where your focus is, you will miss a lot. You will miss out of a lot of risk and opportunity, something that you needed to either mitigate or take advantage of because carriers do apply smarter tactics when we come to capacity management. I'll get more closer into that when we cross that bridge. So let's get to it. Six factors to watch in 2024. Above all, and this is actually a rank session so consumer spending at the end of the day that's what it's all about the demand from consumers in any given form it may say and one factor that is impacting consumer spending very much these days is of course inflation high interest rates and literally the cost of living prices something that is still on regardless of the fact that inflation as alluded to here is trending downwards also heading into 2024 but still uh, remain elevated uh, when compared to uh, historic terms and be very much aware i mean once we have uh, inflation rising from two percent to to ten percent that's just uh, say an illustration of goods becoming more costly going forward also even though we see inflation coming down that doesn't mean pricing are coming down just means that well higher prices will come around at slower speed than what we got used to during 2021 and 2022. so that's the most essential factor to watch out for in a market that we may argue are more biased towards the supply side of it in the end the optimism the volatility in the markets will come about mostly due to jumps 
and positive developments or whatever development that you may see in consumer spending. Flip side of the coin, and as alluded to just before, we are heading in to another massive delivery year for container shipping capacity. As you can see here in the dark, uh, well, basically very dark blue, those are ships already in active service. In less dark blue, you have expected deliveries for whatever is left of 2023, but also looking into 2024. Against all that new capacity and due to the fact that earnings are coming considerably down, liners and say pure tonnage providers, other kinds of ship owners will also seek to balance out uh, some of that uh, say fundamental pressure by demolishing excess capacity, either because it becomes, well, without demand for it, either becomes uh, because it, uh, we will see a new tighter regulation scheme coming into force with EU ETS, for instance, that's just one of them uh, coming into force 2024. And we have also other uh, energy efficiencies, uh, regulatory uh, headwinds, if you uh, call it that, at least from a ship owner perspective, that may also push up that of demolition uh, in the coming year. If you balance out what uh, what we expect the fleet size to be at the end of 2023 against the net inflow of next year, we will be somewhere between six and 7% of fleet growth against a demand growth, which just to recap, will be around two to 3%. So obviously the markets are stacked against higher earnings, higher rates, improved conditions for uh, carriers, but I mean, for, for the shippers, those that are actually buying freight in the market, freight forwarders also being the intermediary here, they should be, say, pretty happy about this development with much lower costs. Also, I mean, it's fair also to uh, to allude to the fact and referring back to, uh, to that of inflation, those were OECD averages. If you look at China, we have basically uh, experienced more than half a year now with producer prices, but also recently consumer prices coming down to the extent that they are facing deflation. That should be, say, an upside, potential upside to container shipping going into next year also, as the Western economies facing inflation is basically importing a little bit of deflation when they buy cheaper goods from China, the world's factory for many of these products that go into the containers that you see also in front of you here right now. Another factor that we at Sonetta expect to uh, to have a, a return next year following crazy years is seasonality. So where we are right now uh, in, uh, in early November, we're basically coming out of a more or less non-existing peak season. Often you will see the third quarter as the quarter where most boxes are moved on a global scale. If you look more narrowly into development of freight rates, you will also have spikes in January, February going in and out of Chinese Lunar New Year. You will also around 1st of October when you have a Chinese national holiday, you will see when uh, when goods are not shipped out of China to the extent that they would otherwise do on a regular flow. That is also something that impacts rates to a large extent. And then you have the summer lull in between. So, so that is a little bit of the volatility that we expect to return following a couple of years where it has been all but seasonality that we have focused on. So, uh, so let's look forward to, to January to, to February when we will have the next, say, uh, potential mini peak uh, coming into uh, to the, to the market. And by peak, I do not mean $10,000 per FEU. I mean, carriers acting smart, perhaps blanking a lot of sailings, trying to uh, push for general rate increases ahead of the uh, seasonality peak. So watch this space for also an update on that. You may or may not know it, but uh, at Sonetta, we, we do push a lot of insights into uh, to the open market. You will find that either on sonetta.com forward slash block or follow um, my LinkedIn profile is also full of great insights in my own humbleness. 
as you can tell. Industrial action on the US East Coast and Gulf Coast. Oh, that gives North American importers the chills for sure. Because just coming out of 2023, where the labor union and the employers on the US West Coast really had a tough time negotiating and finally striking a deal. Let alone what then happened in Canada and what is also still happening in Canada. Fast forward, where are we now? The US East Coast and Gulf Coast ports and terminals have tried to fast track their negotiations for a new multi-year contract that will expire about uh, in, in September next year. In order not to get disruptions like we have seen on the supply chains connecting most like most uh, most uh, most of all uh, far east to us west coast but going forward when we now turn our attention to the us east coast and gulf coast that's not only from far east but certainly also from north europe into uh, to to north america and if we get something that would look like what we saw on US West Coast, perhaps we will also see a, res a reversal of what we have in front of us here right now, where you can fully see that the uh, purple line, which is the US East Coast market share of uh, Far Eastern imports to the US, have been elevated from uh, from 34 percent to uh, to to more than 38 uh, at least at the, uh, approximately a year ago sitting uh, very nicely uh, around 37 and a half percent right now this is one indicator of shippers acting in response to the problems that was right in front of them so a risk to manage going into 2024 is definitely the industrial action that may or may not be impacting north american importers and those ripples into the wider supply chains because i mean something that uh, that is also in between far east and us east coast and gulf coast is the panama canal and we surely know that uh, there's also a limit to how much cargo can actually be fitted through that vital choke point right now with uh, with a, a drought period extended into at least the middle of 2024 again be very careful to watch that factor too those of you who are following news also on line of shipping will uh, most likely know that uh, the European Commission decided not to extend the exemption for uh, the block exemption for liner consortia uh, no longer than April next year. It doesn't mean that all alliances in its current form will be Ill illegal uh, following that, uh, say, expiration. But it does require uh, every liner and every uh, carrier operating within alliances to comply to a standard, uh, say, uh, antitrust rule that you have in the EU. So a lot of red tape will definitely be, uh, say, carefully considered going into, uh, well, basically right here, right now in the, uh, in the final month of 2023 but also in the early stage of 2024, because I mean, the, uh, the fact that 2M decided to uh, to break up, that was announced back in February this year, prompted probably also some of the other alliances to rethink, are we doing the right thing here? Uh, is something happening at least with the MSC and MERS, which we should act upon? I'm not really sure whether they have all concluded that discussion because Ocean Alliance and the Alliance were alliances that were not meant to expire until 2027 and 2030. But what they certainly see right now in front of them is, is a changed environment, not only from the dissolvement of 2M, but also now in the non-continuation of the block exemption into EU. Time will tell whether the FMC in US will also change whatever uh, is, is say required from carriers operating on the North American continent right now. But the most important part I think is uh, is uh, the European Commission in uh, in this case. So, uh, so be very much aware that, uh, that if you are a carrier focusing only on liner shipping, the behavior of that carrier will be different from a carrier that is set to continue down the road of being an integrator 
basically looking a little bit like freight forwarder, but owning their own ships. From a shipper's perspective, it becomes a little bit more murky in terms of what, how can I say compare the offers that I do get when I go tendering and budgeting. But uh, in essence, I mean, this is a transition and, uh, and it may be fairly recognizable uh, in hybrid forms when you look beyond uh, the current breakup, but, uh, but expect something to happen also in this field. Something that have already happened in this field let me uh, let me give you a sneak peek into that. If we focus only on capacity deployed into Mediterranean from Far East, you can see to to the left uh, on my slide here, uh, split into alliances and also highlighting capacity deployed outside alliances. This is basically capacity that's not only applied into a trade like this by carriers not involved in an alliance at all, but certainly also someone that is well, about to break up, as you can see on the right hand side here, MSC have to an increasing extent been offering uh, capacity of their own into the Far East met in the most recent quarters. So that's also insights that, of course, uh, our customers at Senator can find on our platform when they analyze and benchmark their own performance and their market position when heading into special 2024. Another factor essential to watch out for, and I think this is actually factor number six, uh, carbon emissions. Will new regulation force changes? You may or may not know that uh, that Senetta, with our partner Marine Benchmark, have a tool available that names and fames those carriers that do a good job in managing the carbon emissions per transported ton of cargo. So what we have here in front of you is uh, top 13 trade lanes. We have singled out the uh, performance on, say, the average of the trade lanes. So uh, on our platform, obviously, you can drill down into the individual carriers. But if you look at, car say, uh, carbon emissions only uh, on trades, what you see to, uh, to the right-hand side, US East Coast to Met, for instance, you see carriers are doing a uh, Worst job today, cutting emissions on that trade, uh, as compared to, for instance, North Europe to South America is the East Coast, which you which you will find approximately in the middle, where you can see that the change year on year is close to 30% down on the emissions made per ton of cargo carried. So a lot to take away from, uh, from maritime decarbonization, and we will definitely also see that carriers will adjust their behavior accordingly to the requirements for a maritime decarbonization in whichever form it may take. And uh, on, on the fuel side of things, uh, on the new building side of things, but also uh, in terms of uh, current offerings in the market to those uh, customers and forwarders that, uh, that also set up, say, greener choices uh, for, for logistics on a global scale. One measurement that is definitely benefiting uh, emissions uh, at large is slower speed. As you can see here, that has been widely applied across the fleet uh, since the peak of uh, of uh, the uh, the speed in the early days of 2021. Basically, trough was beyond us now, or is beyond us with the February low, uh, especially for the 12,000 to 17,000 TEU ships here, finding an average speed below 14 knots. Smart way of deploying capacity inefficiently, but definitely helping them whenever they need to fill up their ships in order to make every voyage profitable when lower utilization factors or filling ratios of those ships would otherwise bring around a loss-making environment. As you can see here to the right-hand side here, once he, uh, say TEU moved per TEU of capacity, it's really coming down significantly when you compare to pre-pandemic levels. That means that capacity is absorbed by the market, either by slow steaming, as this is an indicator for, or by basically rerouting your ships into uh, to longer sailing distances when you bring them back. That could be a trade like Europe back into Asia uh, via Cape of Good Hope. That would really, say, bring around, say, longer sailing time and absorb capacity in a, say, fairly artificial manner. 
This is not a very artificial manner, but this is very indicative of the development that we also see now that the markets are tightening for for the carriers as well as the non-operating owners. Um, those ships that are taking out of active service simply because there is no demand for them. If you uh, followed Seneta at this hour last year, uh, you would have heard us speak about a million TUs being idled uh, going into uh, to 2023. And we actually almost got that quite early on, uh, but you can certainly also see that, uh, I mean, mostly focusing on the blue, dark blue and the light blue to the left, uh, because in green, that's a fairly stable level of ships in dry dock. So disregard that, that is, uh, say, not necessarily a response to market hardship in the same way as the blue and light blue line uh, or area is. But most recently, you have also seen that uh, that actually a doubling uh, of uh, uh, the portion of uh, the total fleet uh, is, uh, is, is now being idled. Our expectations are that this tool will be applied also by carriers and tons providers next year as they seek to balance the market with what they like the least as an outright layer of capacity. As I'm about to uh, wrap up uh, my session, focusing on the 2024 outlook for ocean shipping uh, by Seneta, let me just bring home what I mean by no two trades are like. Because what you have in front of you here now is two classic, much used backhauls. And by backhaul, I mean that's that's not the uh, the trade that sets the tone for capacity deployed by carriers. This is where empties are repositioned, but where a lot of volume is still being transported, but less volume than on the other, say, direction of that corridor. So what we have in front of us right here, right now, is in blue line, U.S. West Coast to China, obviously the Transpac backhaul, and we have also North Europe to China. You can see a lot of boxes are moved every year on those trains. But if we focus on the black line first and foremost, for more than two years now, almost soon to be two and a half years, we have seen a continued decline of rates, right? At a point in time when we have seen capacity being managed in a smarter way on the transpack by the carriers, having a knock-on effect on the backhaul also, as you can see in the blue line here. Because there was a delayed effect in lifting rates in the COVID years, and now we also see a very much delayed effect in the decline of freight rates that still sits, well, down from earlier peaks, but when compared to where they once were, at around $600, you see still $900 on the backhaul transpack. So you cannot just look at front holes and you cannot just look at, say, any given backhaul because they do move in not mysterious ways, but they, they move in different ways, all of them. So my question to you guys is, did you prepare your budgets for this? Did you inform yourself that something like this would impact you also next year instead of just a brain dead, okay, we're back to square one, everything looks like what it once did because it surely doesn't. Another example of trade lanes that are shifting, look at the exports and the destination of Chinese exports in particular, comparing 2022 to 2021 and also the first eight months of this year when compared to that of last year. I've singled out two main trades to link to the previous slide. So if we look at demand into North America, you can see that it's falling and then it's falling even more. If you look at Europe, you can see it fell last year when compared to the previous year, but it's going up this year. Again, you can always find nuances in this because if you drill down into Europe, you will also see that China to North Europe is down this year, whereas China to Mediterranean, which is basically the two regions, sub-regions combined in Europe here, has grown quite significantly. Those changes will definitely also impact your position in the market, impacting also on where carriers do deploy on a global scale. Look at the demand 
that's all of a sudden growing rapidly into South and Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa even, but also India's subcontinent is really the bright star right now. Almost 20% growth in the first eight months of this year. So smarter exporters do find new destinations also uh, anywhere in the world, even though we have, say, an overall trend. So many subtrends that you need to watch out for. And another subtrend, and just to bring home the argument of no two trades are alike, and the fact that we are not really, say, having a reset to the pre-pandemic levels. This is what we call global schedule reliability, uh, courtesy of our partner C Intelligence. In the orange, you see the best performing trade right now, but also an indication of where rates or where, say, schedule reliability could be if it was back to where it once was. In the black line, you have the global, which is basically encompassing all the traits that are covered by this uh, methodology. And it's still some 20 percentage points below where it once was. So apparently, carriers are not really focusing on delivering a, a reliability uh, back to, uh, to to shippers that that they, uh, they they have so much hungered for during the COVID years, when goods just happen to arrive, arrive whenever. So ample room for improvement, I would say, from the carrier side of things. And just if you look at the two uh, lines towards the bottom of this uh, this chart, you see in purple and, and green also scraping at an appallingly low level from Far East into the coasts of US, uh, 40%. That means every six ship is not arriving according to, to, to the agreed time. How bad is that? On that regard, I thank you so much for your kind attention. It was a pleasure to be here at the International Trade Live uh, event and share our, uh, say, forecast and insights on the current market and where we expect the ocean shipping freight rates and the market as such to be trending in 2024. Have a great day and thank you. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was an incredibly uh, detailed presentation and a fantastic use of data. I think sometimes um, we can be a bit overwhelmed when it comes to complex data, but you definitely showed that in a very, very visually clear way and very easy to follow. Um, going into the questions, um, our overarching theme for this event has been automation, digitalization, and reliability. Um, during your presentation, you did talk about um, decarbonisation. What about uh, what are your predictions for 2024 when it comes to um, shipping lines um, continuing to respond to the, to the demand for digitalisation and also automation? It's a really good question uh, because I think everyone working in global logistics would like to do things smarter tomorrow than what they did today. And digitalization, automation, making use of a, a platform like Senetas for, for 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 say informing your decision making processes and uh, and and get some actionable insights is that center stage of, of, of what everyone is doing. Uh, so so I think that that trend is uh, is 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 something that is here to stay for sure forceful as it may be but at a at a different gale force i would uh, i would say at least if i look at some of the digital offerings that we have seen introduced into the ocean shipping uh, space uh, for uh, for a decade and a half perhaps now already we have seen a lot tried out and we have now seen perhaps uh, a lot of say reiterations into uh, to also adjusting and refining what is the better way of, of offering, say, digital solutions into uh, the logistics uh, field of, uh, of selling and buying freight? Uh, and I must say that the jury is still out on what's the right and optimal way to do it. Uh, but we surely know now that, that, that we have uh, some forwarders and, and carriers offering more or less uh, real-time, uh, minute-by-minute updates on, say, spot rates for, for, for key uh, trade lanes. Um, automation, I would still see, uh, say, um, 
at Sonetta, we do have, uh, say, tender benchmarking tools. Uh, and that's also one process that used to be very, say, uh, hands-on, uh, done in, uh, say, many uh, reiterative processes, uh, pushing spreadsheets back and forward. But uh, but if you can, uh, say, do things in a smarter way, especially if you have very, very complex trade uh, networks uh, to, to to operate and, and move goods on a lot of different corridors, uh, the smarter you can uh, work uh, your way through uh, all of those uh, those data uh, that you allude to also, uh, Joseph, in, in, in that uh, field, is, uh, is, is you need to do things smarter all the time um finally wrapping up i think um, uh, if we look also at, at some of the uh, say the key elements of uh, of the uh, negotiations on us west coast and us east coast ports and terminals automation in uh, terminals was uh, was a key element uh, of uh, say the negotiations uh, between the parties, and I'm not really sure that neither party was happy, but uh, but it again it's a it's a mega trend. It's a trend that uh, that is here to stay. Uh, we cannot take it back, even though some may argue that it was so much better in uh, in the old days. Uh, I think also uh, if you look at uh, uh, digital forwarders, uh, they are probably also now regrouping and, and finding uh, and say or at least finding themselves in the need of, uh, of looking at their current offering is uh, is it also uh, is it equally good to uh, to, to what it uh, it uh, perhaps was uh, during the covid years uh, and if not uh, then uh, then i think they they really need to um, say look fast at a uh, digital offering like that in order to uh, to ensure that that customers are also appreciating uh, all the efforts uh, towards uh, digitalization and and automation but uh, but in the end i think shipping in in all aspects remain business driven by you and i it's a personal business in the end it's all it's all about a handshake uh, very little is moved only by say digital solutions uh, at the end of the day there's always a person behind so so i think that's probably also a trend that uh, that, uh, that that everyone should be uh, should be aware of is is still super strong and what about when it comes to shipping versus uh, air freight? Um, obviously, shipping is the front runner when it comes to the transportation of goods uh, around the globe. Do you think 2024 might be the year that we start to see more of an influence or more of a um, uh, demand for air freight solutions? I think air freight is facing a few obstacles in in that sense. Uh, you're probably also seeing the uh, the advert by the Apple, where they basically talk to Mother Nature and and then commit to uh, to more uh, transport uh, being done on ocean as compared to air, and that's of course uh, due to also a key focus on decarbonizing supply chains. Uh, so I think that factor is obviously uh, say uh, facing air freight more significantly than 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 ocean freight. Uh, it is very few options you have to really decarbonize uh, uh, air freight uh, right now uh, and air freight remains uh, a must go transport form for those of uh, say high valued uh, goods with uh, with a uh, say a must have short transit time uh, but uh, but what is still favoring uh, i think air cargo going into next year is that uh, what i alluded to also global chain reliability I mean, uh, those shippers of, uh, say, higher priced goods need to know that their goods will arrive in due time. So that's probably a boon to, uh, to air cargo also going into next year, that of, say, appallingly low schedule reliability for ocean freight. That's at least how we see that at Sonetta. But, but overall, we still see uh, freight rates trending down towards uh, uh, the um, the pandemic levels may not be uh, quite back to to where it once was. Cost of all kinds of, uh, say, modes of transport now are elevated from the pre-pandemic years. Uh, but I must also say that uh, that we uh, we're probably also seeing some of the early indications on what we expect for ocean shipping, the return of seasonality to actually show up in uh, in air freight uh, right here, right now. With uh, with some uh, more uh, recent uh, spot rate uh, developments, I think about 12% on the most recent uh, weeks. Uh, if you look at the Sonetta data for for global uh, spot rate for for air freight, so um, so uh, also a year of transition for uh, for air freight uh, for sure, uh, but also a clear direction of uh, say a mismatch between demand and supply that will impact next year. 
And just finally, Peter, you um, referred to 2023 as being the, the transition year or the year of transition. Um, if we imagine ourselves speaking again in a year's time, what do you think might be or what do you hope might be the, the term that you'll be using to describe 2024? Uh, that's surely a curveball, uh, but uh, <laughs> but something that uh, that I'm up for. Uh, I think if I should um, put one label to it, I think that could probably be say reset, still in progress, uh, something like that. Uh, as I uh, I do not see a market a year from now that is fully recognizable to what it once was. Uh, a way that I often describe uh, the changes in the market that. I mean, you will always see similarities to what once was, but there is always something which is not recognizable from what it was yesterday or last year. Uh, but reset still in progress, uh, I think, is is also something that everyone looks forward to, getting back to normality in terms of, yeah, hopefully also reliability, but certainly also better transit times, more foreseeability, and perhaps also, uh, say, something that, that looked like, uh, say, what once was in, uh, in, in normal business and global trade. And, and fewer headwinds. Well, um, only time will tell and perhaps well, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to speak again in a year's time and see um, how accurate that term was. Thank you so much, Peter, once again for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.